So I'm really happy as a certain small small miracle happened that yesterday I was almost convinced that well we won't see this book before Christmas or something like that because it's sometimes very um, cumbersome. But it as a miracle it arrived today. <laughs> so please take a look. Um, well, Stefano did show you, uh, but he never gave out, not even to me, from his hand, the only copy he is possessing. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, we have a very, very nice poster, um, um, and uh, Professor Bengini is taking it, this with, with him at home, and, and promised to me that he put it on him. On, on the wall of the University of Bologna, in all of the campuses. Yeah. <laughs> the first book launch was organized by IASC, uh, in cooperation with, of course, with the University of Pannonia, whose director, Andras, also arrived. It's also a little miracle. He spent six hours uh, in a fro freezing, very terrible train. Um, so everyone is welcome. Today, um, we will be, there will be a different setup. We have two main, um, presentations, but they won't last longer than 10, 15 minutes, and then we broaden up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, and uh, Stefano com comes out and, and answers some of the points, and then we have other younger fellows and other people who are also making comments, so this is becoming more kind of a workshop for our these students and, and grantees. And um, so please, um, who, would, who would like to start? Um, Erhard, would you like to start? No, Jim. Jim, go on. <laughs> Good. So, it's always a dangerous spot. Jim Scully. <laughs> um, thanks. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I very much enjoyed reading uh, Stefano's um, major work, I would say. I, I made notes about it and said I, 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 it showed a degree of erudition that I think is quite exceptional. I learned a great deal from it. I thought the historical detail was actually stunning. It should be a kind of required reading and a kind of, you know, before anybody starts anything else, actually, I think they should start that. It puts contemporary political issues and those of the recent past in finely nuanced historical perspective. Um, and um, the European history that Bianchini uh, articulates might readily be an example of what Samuel Beckett called the mess, in simple terms. Um, Beckett noted that confusion is not my invention. It is all around us, and our only chance now is to let it in. The only chance of renovation is to open our eyes and see the mess. It is not a mess you can make sense of. Bianchini does a good... He does a good job of trying to make sense of it, I think. Um, uh, a couple of points. Uh, for example, as he notes on pages 130 and 131, divisive nationalist behavior has significantly undermined the nation state's cultural horizon and contributed to the bias that minorities, that is, any kind of diversities, are a threat to society. The consequence, he argues, is that the collective and individual empathy toward otherness has been seriously jeopardized, while racism, xenophobia, and the rejection of otherness have found fertile ground for developing authoritarian and self-referential societies. These insights are further supported by his analysis of the complications that developed in the shaping of the Dayton Accords in the mid-1990s. The treaty, as he points out, was deeply influenced by what he has characterized as a primary ambiguity, the negative implications of which are not only visible 25 years after the ratification of the treaty, but as he claims, are also responsible for why Bosnia-Herzegovina has become a, quote, failed state. It is in his concluding remarks that we find some rays of hope that may push the European Union project forward, because it represents, in his words, a unique institutional opportunity to drive the still culturally painful transformation from the national form of the state to a post-nation state society. Although, like the weather predictions, as he says, this cannot be taken for granted. Instead of lamentations about the elements that might undermine the EU project, he cites a number of factors that may revitalize it. Broadly, he asserts that radical time-space compression 
I heard him using that term yesterday too, is reconfiguring the sense of belonging and creating new, uh, new geographies. Thus, he cites several factors from low-cost air flights, internet connections, which in spite of state surveillance, increasingly annihilates the sense of limits and makes borders virtually non-existent. In addition, EU policies supporting multilingualism, Erasmus mobility, inter-university cooperation, transnational economic production and management, and the multiplication of religious beliefs may all help in the design of a highly diversified society across Europe. It is his final comment that I find most inspirational, personally. He argues, rightly, I think, that the nature of democracy is affected by the clashing dynamics of integration and disintegration. While the content, he emphasizes, of democracy is changing, with expanding demands for equality of treatments and access to rights, including recognition of pluralities, and the development of syncretism. The difficulties that this unleashes, he argues, are, however, to be found in the persistence of nation-state institutions and political cultures, which firmly resist the development of intercultural post-nation-state policies and societal lifestyles. And although he is skeptical about a progressive response, I think it is inevitable, although I think it is up to us to help lead this necessary transformation. And it's here that I think we need to add elements of a new discourse. Let me say first that <laughs> one of your comments um, about U.S. President Harry Truman that you made only convinced me that we genu genuinely need a field called Cold War Studies. Because what we need to do is to understand how the current situation was fostered by not just the countries of Europe and the peoples of Europe, but in point of fact by the United States. Deeply involved, as you know, and the CIA had something to do with an Italian election early on after World War II. Um, uh, on page 131 of your manuscript, you state that an additional key aspect that ultimately resulted in the Cold War, and this I would be terribly critical of, right? <laughs> one of those things that jumped off the page at me, was, quote, related to the personality of the new American president since Roosevelt died in April 1945 and was replaced by Harry Truman, who had a different view of relations with Stalin and the USSR. I'm sorry, Stefano. <laughs> it wasn't his personality. It was the Prendergast machine in uh, Missouri that first brought him to national promise, prominence. He didn't know very much at all and made numerous errors in his immediate presidency. And the reason he became president was that certain people and institutions did not want Henry Wallace to be president. Henry Wallace was the vice president up until 1944. And at the convention in 1944, he was not chosen, and forces organized to keep him from becoming the president because they expected Roosevelt would die. And he was one of the great social democratic visionaries in the United States. And the United States subsequently took a completely different path than if he had been president. Um, the Soviet threat essentially didn't exist, but they managed to put it together. He was terribly confused about it for some time. A um, couple of other things. Um, one of the things I've been concerned about, and um, shall we say everyone tries to do it or does it, and that is that they cite public opinion as though public opinion is a steady, stable phenomenon. In point of fact, uh, and Jay Rosen, a former colleague at NYU, makes this very clear. Uh, the question isn't what is public opinion. The question is what does the public know, right? And he would argue very strongly, I think, that public opinion, people have public opinion, right? A personal opinion, but they have no knowledge base, right? So to suggest that they are kind of no knowledgeable about certain events is completely mistaken. Um, a couple of other things. Then. Sorry to be. I don't want to give you all this stuff now. I, I'll send you some things afterwards. Yes, no, no, no. Um, 
One of the other things, that, and I find this to be a failing in international relations, and that is the use of the personal pronoun for the state. Uh, so that uh, Germany will do, or the United States will, as though it is a person. It is not a person. I would argue very strongly that when you use, you want to reference activities uh, that are sponsored by the German government or anyone else in that kind of status, that we in fact say the German government rather than Germany. And this has been a project that my colleagues, uh, George Lakoff and, and uh, uh, Paul Chilton, you may remember them, they were at a seminar I organized that you were at, Ferry, um, have put together, and we need to challenge journalists around this tendency, it seems to me. Um, it's just too easy to say Germany did, as though it was a person. And then you get the, the egotists, you know, like, uh, who's the current president of the United States, um, that, that, who comes out and says, who comes out and becomes the United States in his own mind, you know. And that's problematic, it seems to me. A um, couple of other things. Um, I would have thought that you would have referenced a couple of people, most notably M Michael Billig and his work on banal nationalism. Um, because Billig is really quite, it seems to me, his critique is very, very positive. And by the way, the New York Times has an interactive piece today. <laughs> Did you see it already, so, Jody? So difficult. <laughs> no, but I, on national identity. Yeah. You know, and they say, they come out and say that it's fake. <laughs> it's fake. <laughs> I mean, I'm front page of the New York Times. I'm quite amazed. Um, we, we, we send them your paper. What's that? We, we send them. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I thought of sending them the book. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of other things. So we'll just we'll note, uh, you know, um, you know, Billy talks about the flagging of the nation everywhere. You know, um, I remember my students in Pennsylvania saying that they were going down to get a pizza at the real American pizza place. You know, I've had, I've had enough of this. Really, you know. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's as opposed to real Italian pizza. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and I would have thought too that you might have used um, Shlomo Zand and his critique, the invention of the Jewish people, uh, which I find to be a very, very compelling argument. And a couple of years ago, we had the the Israeli ambassador here for the summer university, you and I, 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 yeah. at the end of it, I. I took him aside a bit and I said, so uh, what's your response to Shlomo Sand? <laughs> and he went, don't even talk to me about Shlomo Sand, <laughs> right? Because it is a fundamental threat to the uh, national identity that is fostered in Israel. So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, and he's, he's uh, you know, Zand, uh, it seems to me, has a compelling uh, issue. The other person, finally, I'll just make this final comment, um, Stefano, and that is John Uri. John Uri wrote a book called Sociology Beyond <coughs> Societies. I, and this is one of, one of the things that worries me is that we all live in these silos. And uh, Uri, Uri was in um, Leeds, I believe it was, and he took Margaret Thatcher's comment, there is no such thing as society. They're only individuals and their families. He took it seriously. And he looked at what had happened to what we think of as society. He would argue today that we should, we should think in terms of mobilities, et cetera. And one of the problems that I think he um, uh, points us towards is the fact that many political elites and governments tend to think there is something called society as though it's a stable entity from the 19th or 18th century, right? And what he, what he does, therefore, is to suggest this is really <coughs> the problem for both governments and political elites and political parties, that there is, you know, society as we have learned to think about it ain't there. So the thing to do is to think about how to... Uh, how to have governments and political policies that transcend the notion of this stable entity called society. But thank you very much. Thank you, you. you helped 
me um, a great deal in thinking about certain projects. Wonderful, interesting, Thanks. provocative uh, comments. Then we move forward. Thank Dr. you very much, Ferenc. Uh, <coughs> and I have to ask for your patience and for your understanding because I'm coming from another side. Having read the, the old paper, uh, I'm not commenting on the book because uh, it is uh, within. There are a lot of separate questions here put together and it would be inter interesting, I think, to focus on the different questions which are touched here. I'm trying uh, to uh, add a certain view. Uh, the temptation for me is to look to the history of my country. Uh, Austria is now celebrating 100 years of the Republic of Austria. Uh, here, the difficulties are starting or are continued. Uh, I think we had one group in Austria, partly political social democrats, saying Austria was founded in 1918. Then we have uh, some saying it was not founded, it was existing before, uh, but nobody knows when it really started. Uh, it's a difficulty, what does Austria mean? Uh, from the Habsburgs, the Casa Austria is coming. It's a feeling uh, of a family enterprise, uh, may I say. Uh, it's not national identity. I think the expression was not even existing. I think it's a product of, of later time, uh, and include, including all the difficulties which are around uh, this expression. Uh, and uh, being here in Kursek, you can see the difficulties. Uh, as I was coming in, uh, seeing the plate uh, of the city, Kazakh, uh, Hungarian, uh, 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 Croat, Kizek, Kizek, Guns, the Austrian of Deutsch, the Austrian expression. Uh, here you have the mixed situation. What is it here? Huh? I think uh, my grandfather would have said it's Austria. Huh? Uh, even if this kingdom of Hungary it was also for him Austria, right, because right, right. In, in a bigger sense. Uh, that came out uh, in the division between Austria and Hungary uh, in the late time of Habsburg, uh, since 1967. I think the one part was named Kingdom of Hungary, the other was not named Austria, it was named uh, die im Reichsrat vertreten an Königreiche und Länder. Uh, those parts uh, uh, of the monarchy being represented in the Reichsrat, in the parliament. Uh, I think there was no Austrian identity because here the Habsburg and the government tried to keep Austria as a bigger entity uh, here. In 1918, what was left is Austria. What was left, uh, that's a very important expression, because uh, our beloved Clemenceau said, Lodrich Celerest. Uh, I think after falling into pieces and so on, Austria was the rest. For the Austrians, it was not clear what are they. So far, they decided we are Deutsch Österreich, we are German Austria, uh, which is horrible now, seen uh, under the auspices of. Uh, of the Nazis and Third Reich and so on and so on. It is understandable for the time because the meaning was the German-speaking parts of the old monarchy. Right. Because in the first decision, uh, although the parts were included, uh, Sudet Sudetia, uh, this part of uh, later on Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Czechish part, uh, it was also included uh, parts of Slovenia uh, and so on and so on. And they were present in the parliament. Yeah? Uh, but then by the decision of the Paris Treaty and so on and so on, uh, L'Autriche Celerest, uh, that was left here. And that was a problem of the identity of my country. Yeah? I will never forget, beg your pardon for telling personal stories, uh, my father uh, is born 1903. Uh, he went to school, uh, he was always telling that he was taking part uh, as a young student at the funeral of Emperor Franz Josef. Uh, they had to go behind and so on and so on, uh, being officially very sad. Then in 1918, he was present at the declaration of the Republic in front of the parliament. Uh, I think I visited with him in an exhibition uh, where a lot of people were standing in front of the parliament. And then he was going along the photo and said, I might be here I'm standing in one edge. Uh, said, okay, uh, what did you do there? 
uh, he said it was a real problem because my school class came with the wrong colors. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, <coughs> they had uh, uh, schwarz rot gold, uh, black, red, gold, which was the sign uh, of Germany. Germany. Yeah? Uh, and then what did you do? We, said, we recognized we had the wrong flag with us, and therefore we went off. Huh? Uh, so far, officially the beginning of Austria, on parts of saying this is the Austrian identity now from 1918, but for a lot of the population it was really nothing. It was not quite clear uh, what it is really. Uh, I think uh, it is one of the merits uh, of Hitler and uh, Nazi German that the Austrian identity was created after the Second World War. Uh, that's a very interesting case. Creating a kind of national identity through the sad happenings uh, which have been, uh, I think uh, the generation of my parents recognized, I think uh, there should be some special uh, thing on Austria. I was the chair of uh, an organization of all the Austrian youth organizations a long time ago. Uh, and. Uh, we had a problem, uh, we did not want, it was a uh, uh, decision to take uh, organizations or youth organizations within, we did not want to have uh, the youth organizations of the Freiheitliche Partei. This is the third part, uh, the, it's not a liberal party, it's always uh, strong translated in, <laughs> in, in English. Uh, I think that was what was left from the German nationalists, I may say, uh, still existing also again in the government. I think uh, the heritage is a little bit going down, but it is still coming up also. Uh, don't underestimate this. Uh, and I think here we decided in this organization, Austrian News Council, we said, I think we are only taking organizations uh, who are believing in the Austrian nation. <laughs> Uh, we had a tough discussion. I may confess you, I don't believe that an Austrian nation is really existing because the result what is Austria is, uh, we helped uh, with a certain expression, Kulturnation, cultural nation, yeah, yeah. which I think uh, is only an instrument to overcome the difficulty. Huh? Because what means culture? Huh? I think there's a certain feeling by a majority of Austrians there's a lot of, of things in common which is going over borders of the actual Austria, because here we feel connected with parts of Czechia, with parts of Hungary, and so on and so on. One of the most difficult problems we have is always to explain which composer, which writer, which architect is an Austrian or is a Hungarian, yeah, and yeah, so on and so on. Famously Franz Liszt, yeah? Yeah, yeah? You named now my example, because he was born what is now Austria in writing, uh, his name was uh, Franz Liszt. Uh, now you have the Liszt Ferenc Airport and the Liszt Ferenc <laughs> Academy. But the problem of Ferenc Liszt was that he never learned uh, the, the Hungarian language until the end of the life. Towards the end of his he life. He tried it four times. Uh, and I think as a Hungarian composer, being buried in Bayreuth is not the right place for, <laughs> for an Hungarian. He's a sign of another direction because he so admired Richard Wagner. This is this is an endless debate. We are, not, we are not going to come to this. Endless between Austrians. That's a very good example because it is a symbol for endless debates. You have one actual debate: what is Macedonia? Huh? That's a real problem. What is Macedonia? I read an article in, in a German newspaper. Uh, about the battle uh, using Macedonia. Even for the kitchen, uh, the Greeks are now trying to protect the expression Macedonia for the kitchen through UNESCO. Uh, <laughs> here you can see, may I say, and uh, I'm jumping over a lot of statements which have the, the expression of nation, nation state is a nonsense. Yeah. I think the nation state really is not existing. There might be some examples, uh, but a pure nation state, in a pure sense that they all one nation, I think does not exist in the world because you have rests uh, nearly of everything uh, in the countries and for sure the history and the culture uh, in general. That's one of the nonsense. 
so far I think liquid nationalism is a help instrument to overcome liquid. I think we are saying this question, everything is liquid. So far you cannot fix real borders. Uh, and here we are amidst the problem which is described uh, especially very visible by the maps in these books, uh, in this book, uh, that we have uh, such a lot of changes concerning the borders. Uh, I was responsible together with some friends. Uh, we built up a center for democracy and reconciliation for Southeast Europe. It is a Dutch foundation which is based in Thessaloniki. You can see <laughs> what the difference is. Uh, we did studies on uh, history books in the different countries of the Balkans. It's very interesting. Now we have six volumes. Uh, and uh, don't read it because uh, it's really boring. You have to look to two very good examples. The one are the different maps used in the school books, and the others are the caricatures about, in the one book, about the others. And here you can see problems uh, of the differences. <coughs> I think which kind of identity, which kind of map, and so on and so on. I learned in this book, for example, uh, that my home city, Vienna, uh, was uh, originally Slovene. Why? It is written in the history books of the Slovenes because uh, uh, the name uh, of uh, uh, Vienna in the Slovene language is Duna, Daniel. Huh? So far, okay, it must have been Slovene. <coughs> they had written the books and Slovenians are now learning uh, that Vienna was a part of, of Slovenia. No? Uh, the interesting thing is that Slovenia never existed before as it was now founded. Here you have the whole problems for, here for sure existing. So for all these discussions about narratives, nation states and so on, I have pure nonsense. And I have very important instrument for education, uh, for state identity, uh, and armies. so on and so on. And armies and armies, uh, fights, border control. Uh, diplomacy, uh, <laughs> negotiations, and, and, and. And I think it will be really endless. Out of this feeling, I think uh, we were going in a certain time by politics and also by intellectual discussions, we have to go for more integration. I think uh, the European integration is one exercise in this direction. Uh, I think we say, I have always explaining to the Europeans that the real idea for European integration came up with the Americans because for the Americans uh, the map of Europe is a horrible thing. You know? Such a lot of states, you know, all very small and so, and if you are going for 100 kilometers, you need a new passport and so on and so on. Uh, therefore, they were pressing by OEC, now OECD, very much for more integration and so on and so on. I think uh, difficult to say in the time of Donald Trump, but the real inventors of European integration were the Americans. Uh, <coughs> for sure. Today it's not such a good model. <laughs> no, no, it's not the American model. I think uh, they tried to bring things here together, uh, which was extremely helpful and, and very important. But I think it's not a question, uh, does it really work? The next step which we have to do is a kind of globalization, which is even more difficult, uh, because here you have the extreme situation that we are really globalized by economy, by information, and, and, and. I think it is a long list which is in common. And we have uh, uh, a counter power uh, against, we want to differentiate. And we want to identify the differentiation. I think that's even more stronger. One of the results of more common Europe is they are, we are getting more separation. You have it in the book, Catalonia, uh, I think, I don't know if Scott, uh, Scotland uh, is here, but it is also a certain sign uh, going here in the same direction. Uh, and you can be sure it will go on uh, further on uh, as a problem uh, and of a development. Why is it happening? Uh, there is one uh, question which is sometimes overseen by politics. I think politics is living, uh, living out very much of creating anxieties. I think a fear, we have a fear for. And uh, this kind of neo-nationalism is not a neo-nationalism. It's the old egoism. We want to protect ourselves. Uh, I think there's an old saying in Vienna, uh, 
everybody thinking on him, him or herself. Only me, I'm thinking on myself. Uh, and that's a characteristic of politics. I think a lot of parties living out of this, and a lot of poli successful politicians are living out of this, uh, even out of this idea. So, uh, thanks to the book, uh, I think a lot of questions are raised, which will uh, accompany us uh, for a further way. I've already mentioned the existence of the nation state, yes or no, I am really skeptical. Uh, the importance of borders. It is very much interesting that by more integration, we have more discussion about borders. We have uh, about borders between states. Border control is now coming up. Uh, I think a real nonsense. We were happy to have no border control between Germany and Austria. Now we have border control in Salzburg and in Passau and so on and so on, out of the fears concerning migration and so on, which is a horrible nonsense. Uh, and the very interesting thing is the border control between, uh, in Salzburg, between Austria and Germany, uh, is created by whom? By the Bavarians, by our closest neighbor. Huh? They want to show Berlin that they have an importance uh, to want to be protected against the Austrians, where the Salzburgers are feeling the closest to, to the Bavarians. So far, I think here every Salzburger is angry on the Bavarians about border control. Uh, and I think don't underestimate this movement. Border control will come up more in general. Uh, for the moment, it is at highways and so on and so on. I think for a very short time, I met border control here at Kursik. Uh, there was also some standing <laughs> one looking at the car, saying, go by, go by, go by. Really silly exercises which are existing, but silliness is a certain instrument of politics. Uh, I think it plays a, a, yeah, a very important yes, even, role. Even, um, uh, Edward, they even built a kind of detour. You have to get yeah. around, get close to the policeman, yeah. uh, you slow down, right. and but then the you go back to the road. And I said it to, to Victor Orban, whom I met in Vienna recently, I think he, he shall do something for closer relations between Hungary and Austria. I think, what do you mean? I think you have to repair the street uh, coming to Kursek. <laughs> <laughs> he knows that. Because it's really he horrible. It's horrible. I think there's a good road on the Austrian side, there is a comfortable road Absolutely. on the Hungarian side, but in between, what did he say? you have 2,000 meters. I think yeah. he said it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> here you can see consequences here. I'm trying to, to put it here in the region here. Uh, you have this kind of egoism to protect myself against what is happening here. We are not really able to, to live with this multicultural world. It's one of the expressions which is very much used, uh, but it's not really happening. Uh, I think I was listening to uh, a speech about uh, borders uh, in, in, in Europe uh, before. Poland was a multicultural entity uh, coming into existence after the First World War. There were only 65% Poles, the rest were Jews, Germans, Russians, and so on and so on. Now they are 95% Polish, uh, not being multicultural. This is our modern world. I think we have to realize it, uh, what tremendous changes uh, we are done here in this direction. Uh, one of the problems uh, I also want to mention is we have the problem to live with history. I started with 1918, 100 years uh, of Austria. Uh, we have now the difficulties to live with history. One party has a, a close, not being a part of the party. Uh, students' organizations, the so-called Schlag in the Verbindung, and I don't know what is the English expressions. Uh, students' association where they are fighting uh, and so on and so on, and you get the sign that you are brave and so on and so on. They are still existing and using uh, books, some books uh, which are idiotic, with texts which are really horrible. Uh, they have it in the cellar, they are saying it, nobody was looking at them, but they are still existing. I think uh, the cleaning up, of, obviously, after the Third Reich did not happen in really. They didn't clean up the cellars, and nobody knows what is coming out of the cellars. I think. Uh, that's always one of uh, the dangers for existing. We did not manage, I think, to live with our history in the different directions, which is also a problem here. That's creating more liquid nationalism 
uh, and is creating uh, a lot of state partitions. I think it was interesting for me going to Catalonia, uh, what was one of the arguments of the Catalans. Uh, you have to know, we in Catalonia, we were fighting with the last Habsburg. It was the later Emperor Charles VI, it was uh, Charles III in, in, in the counting of uh, here. Uh, he wanted to keep the Habsburg uh, uh, sovereignty about this and he lost in Catalonia. So I got told, you Austrians are guilty that we Catalans have this problem. <laughs> Don't underestimate this. It's sometimes silly, but on the other side, I think for sure it is existing uh, as an argument. Uh, jumping from history to the actual situation, <clears throat> we have this problem also concerning the medias. Uh, the medias are living out of creating these tensions uh, and uh, these differentiations. Uh, it is a kind of a new media nationalism, which for sure is existing. Uh, I think the official uh, description of medias, they are connecting people. Are they really connecting? Or are they dividing? Imagine. Uh, and I think this is a, a very important uh, situation because by the modern, modern technology, I think we have even more uh, chances. Uh, so far, uh, I can speak about the education. This is context also lengthy. You can imagine it's for sure not uh, negative. I want to have uh, to create my doubts uh, on the expression narrative. I think everybody now is using we need a European narrative. Do we really have narratives about our own states? Uh, not to speak about the nation state, I think it's for sure not quite clear. We are creating different narratives in a certain competition. Looking to my friend Ahmed Evin, I think the narrative of the Osman, Ottoman Empire is coming up uh, in the background uh, of our friend Erdogan, <laughs> for sure, uh, as an argument. Eh? Uh, sometimes a little bit ridiculous, but on the other side, uh, it plays also a very important role. And uh, I think such ideas of empire are going around. Uh, European newspapers always uh, writing, Vladimir Putin, the new Tsar. Uh, I think that's looking back to history, empire, and so on and so on, which is also here for sure existing. There's no cleaning up in this expression. I think it is very much used uh, in this direction. So far, I have also my doubts uh, on the expression of identity. What is a real identity? I'm only sure about my, my own identity, and here I have sometimes also my doubts on myself. <laughs> but this is another question, it's not the subject of my speech. Beg your pardon for telling it uh, from another side, uh, and maybe scientifically not so serious, but uh, I think a, a personal relation to this uh, may also be helpful. Thank you very much excellent, for your patience. Excellent. Thank you for this. To wonderful comments. And now, I have a dilemma, and I am asking you, uh, would you mind if you would move for, further and have other comments? Um, we have two young and two more senior um, commentators, and then the, 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 the floor is yours. Okay, <coughs> who would continue? Uh, please come, come out, uh, Igor Dimitar, uh, Ahmed, um, and Otilo, and I, I sit here. Um, who would like to continue? Come here, sir. Okay. 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 So, thank you very much. I spent a couple of days with the book, and uh, don't worry, uh, but I even found a motto for that because the favorite. Uh, so to say, a philosophical, intellectual, scholarly background to the book is Sigmund Bauman. And Zygmunt ba in Sigmund Bauman's last book, uh, he says the following. It's called Retropia, retro, uh, Retrotopia, Retrotopia, so dealing how you deal with the past. And he says the following. We take refuge in the past because it can be remodeled at will. So the past can be remodeled at will, thus providing the blissful omnipotence lost in the present. I think uh, Bianchini, uh, Professor Bianchini goes in the opposite direction. Uh, so he, he doesn't remodel the past, 
But as a real historian, he is trying to reconstruct the past as far as possible. But his uh, aim is not to reconstruct the past, but to teach us what we can learn from the past. So I think he is not really interested in history. He is really interested in the future, in the present and the future. But without understanding the past, this is impossible. But the future, the meaning of future, is very different uh, uh, let's say, for my generation and for a great number of other generations. I remember that for my generation, I'm trying to future meant hope. We might have a great future. Let us forget about the present. Let us forget about the future. But future now is the opposite. We are surviving in the present. But what will happen in the future? The future earlier meant hope. No, it means anxiety. And this is also, I think, the basic message of the book. Now, uh, I should like to summarize the significance of the book from two perspectives. The one is in nationalist stud studies and the political message uh, that I was uh, referring to. I think perhaps the Old Testament of nationalist studies might be Hans Kohn's 1944 book. And uh, from him up to the, about the 1980s, so the New Testament uh, being Benedict Anderson, imagined community, so during these approximately 40 years, uh, nationalist studies were based on binary approaches. Western nationalists, Eastern nationalists, civic nationalists, ethnic nationalists, liberal, illiberal, left, right, etc., etc., and always with value implications. So in these binary confrontations, one of them was always considered to be more valuable. Now, if we look at the next generation, Hobsbawm, Gellner, and especially Benedict Anderson, Benedict Anderson brings in print capitalism as a major driving force of a new approach to nationalism. So this is uh, connected to the spread of books, the spread of printing, and industrialization. Now, uh, our also represents a new approach, and this is no more the print capitalism, but the screen capitalism. And the screen capitalism brought about a major change and the traditional approaches to nationalism were challenged by Edward Said, neocolonialism, feminism. We have the spatial turn, we have the linguistic turn, and I think this book fits into what we might call the personal turn. The personal turn. And uh, there are various uh, books and various approaches to this personal turn, so we shouldn't just think of uh, national identity and nationalism in terms of collective identities, but we should more interest in the personal uh, identities. And in this school, uh, there is banal nationalism, national indifference, so this type of approach is uh, uh, everyday ethnicity, so, uh, all these uh, like um, uh, Billig, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, it is into this school that uh, uh, this uh, book fits in. And I think with uh, using Baumann's liquidity, liquid modernity for nationalism, this is a real innovation. And let us hope that it will be as much uh, used as the imagined communities, so uh, as representing a, a new school. Now, so much about the scholarly significance of the book, in my opinion, and now about the political, social significance of the book. So I think this is an excellent elaboration on uh, the relationship between separations and democracy. Uh, we started out uh, generally from the assumption that nation building originally, that's the traditional positive earlier positive, later negative uh, impact of nationalism, that earlier nation building originally held the freedom of the people, so that there is some kind of a correlation between nationalism and liberalism, which is then uh, declining. I think the significance of the book is that it's much more nuanced, much more sophisticated, that you cannot simply draw a chronological borderline and so far it was positive in the nation building and from that time on it is no more positive. 
This is, this is exactly the significance of liquidity, because uh, in some situations it is uh, positive, in other situations it's negative. <coughs> and uh, the main issue is, uh, according to, to our author, is always uh, for the evaluation, for attaching some value to whatever role the national peace is, whether it contributed to the preservation of peace or it didn't contribute to the preservation of peace. So national identities, the emergence, the, the growth of national identity in themselves, an sich, do not have any real value at whatever point, but it always depends on whether they contribute to the preservation of peace or not. And it's an interesting conclusion, so I am talking about the political significance, that even if uh, states are failed on the Balkans, if pre the peace goes on, it doesn't matter. Uh, main, I, uh, main thing is that how can we preserve peace, and that uh, contributes to our, all our discourse of the changing content of uh, democracy. Uh, there is a pessimistic, in my view, the book has a very pessimistic conclusion because it points out that after the golden age of the EU, so a pessimistic political uh, conclusion, the, it came to the balkanization of, of uh, Europe. And uh, I should like now to challenge, uh, uh, finally, uh, before just concluding remarks, a little bit this pessimism. Uh, which uh, stands in contrast a little bit with the overall narrative of the book, because the, 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 it's like the concept of liquidity opens up various options. Because if the tendency toward the nation state can preserve peace, then it's not a negative tendency, if, if it can preserve peace, because that seems to be your major point, and not uh, integration as such. Because there might be situations when the movements towards integration contribute to the preservation of peace. In other situations, this is uh, not uh, always the case. So, so much about the, the political issue. Now, the theoretical option. So you, the great hero of our institute, uh, uh, Professor Elemir Honkish, came up uh, with this uh, quantum theory at the end of his book, how it can be applied for social sciences. Now, I must admit that I had great difficulties in trying to understand what this quantum theory means, but after a number of conversations with Professor Crow, I think, maybe vaguely now I, I understand, and I think that exactly this liquidity, that uh, things uh, do not uh, exist as realities, but potential realities. I think this is a wonderful uh, concept uh, of quantum theory, depending on also of how you measure things. So they do not exist in themselves, but they depend on how you examine them. And this concept of liquidity, I think, can very well applied in social sciences to reflect this identity, because in, uh, in quantum theory, it, it uh, argues that everything has a particle and a wave nature. And this is, I think, very much in line uh, with your argument. As I do not have too much time, just two small remarks. On page 18, you refer to Lajos Kossuth, so as a Hungarian nationalist, I have to add to think. Kossuth, and you say that Kossuth appealed only to aristocrats. No, Kossuth not only appealed to the aristocrats, he was appealing to the medium levels of the nobility. <coughs> and on page 227, you say that An Antal threatened with the revision of the Trianon Treaty. No, Antal didn't threaten with the revision of the Trianon Treaty. He has a famous statement that I am the prime minister of 15 million Hungarians. Uh, and uh, that in soul, in spirit, so that is that, that didn't have any political. Uh, uh, he was implicate. always saying Slovakia is not Slovakia; it's Upper Hungary. <laughs> but, but in history, in history, <laughs> in, in history. But uh, I think that on the whole, he, he didn't have any concrete political plans. Remember that the basic treaties that he was signing 
this government was signing with Ukraine. So he didn't assume that uh, a change of the borders is a, a potential uh, event of the future. So I have a lot of other remarks, but so much for the time being. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for inviting me here, and I'm very sorry that I didn't come yesterday, but I'm now at the, uh, yeah, before the start of uh, this event, Professor Bianchini asked me, are you ready for a new name? <laughs> so, so exactly this would be the topic uh, of, my, of my talk here. Uh, I didn't closely read the whole book, I have to be honest, but uh, wherever Macedonia was being mentioned, you can see what Jim was saying, that it is the big mess. Uh, maybe a little bit bigger than the neighboring countries, but nevertheless it's not unique in, in this sense. Sorry? Macedonia. Macedonia. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> with, two, with, with two S's, yeah. Uh, so, we have a new government since, uh, since last year, and one of the biggest promises, in, in spite of uh, anti-corruption fight, etc., was that they will bring the country back on the Euro-Atlantic path. And uh, in order to do this, they said that they need to solve the big national questions that you can read about uh, in the book of Professor Bianchi. Some of these big national questions that they want to solve within the four-year mandate is, first of all, the internal relations between the communities in the country. And they started uh, uh, solving this issue with the new uh, uh, law on the usage of languages, which is giving bigger linguistic rights primarily to the Albanian minority in the country. Uh, meaning that it can be uh, in official use in every part of the country, even where there, there, there are no Albanians, or even there where there are Albanians less than 20%. The law even goes so far as to say that you can use it uh, on the money uh, and uh, on uh, uh, uniforms of armed forces. However, this law has still not been enacted and is being blocked in the parliament by the opposition. Second very important big national issue for Macedonia is obviously the national identity and uh, the relations with Bulgaria. And in this uh, uh, regard, the government si signed a good neighborly agreement uh, with, with Bulgaria, which has been enacted in both parliaments so far, which recognizes a common history. And is written uh, officially in the, uh, in the agreement, it's written, uh, this, uh, this agreement is written in the languages as recognized by both constitutions of the countries. So it does not say Macedonian and Bulgarian language. And uh, besides uh, uh, containing trade, uh, uh, trade provisions, it also says that it will uh, create uh, uh, common uh, commissions to uh, talk about the differences uh, in uh, historical understandings and also that it will erase any national, uh, negative national stereotyping of the others. Meaning that it will erase for every, from every placard that says, this person was killed by Bulgarian fascist occupi uh, occupier, you will just leave occupier, but not Bulgarian fascist. Uh, third, uh, and connected to this issue, it's also, I don't, I'm not claiming that this was done in coordination with the government, but the Macedonian uh, Orthodox Church, which has had a problem with the Serbian Orthodox Church and thus it was not recognized, in light of this agreement decided to accept the Bulgarian National Church as its mother church who will act as an advocate with other Orthodox churches in the world. And the third most important and sexiest uh, issue here is the name issue with Greece and thus the question from Professor Bianchini because now there are very much heightened talks with uh, Greece about solving the name issue and so far this is the first government that really uh, shows willingness to solve it. There were very big protests in Greece against any kind of solution or any kind of giving, uh, allowing us to use uh, some kind of uh, com complicated formula. And there are accusations of irredentism uh, on the side of Greece, Macedonian 
uh, government uh, uh, sh showed goodwill and it changed the names of the airport and the highway. So the airport and the highway used to be named Alexander the Great, they're renamed by the former government. Now the airport is called International Airport of Skopje and the highway is called Friendship because it goes <laughs> down towards Greece. <laughs> very good but the, the Greece doesn't seem to care. Now the main issue is that the government is agreeing that we can change the name. However, on the Greek side they're asking that this new name is included in the national constitution and also that whenever the trademark Macedonian is used internationally it needs to follow this new name. So whether it is Upper Macedonian, uh, Northern Macedonia, New Macedonia, whatever they agree upon, or just Macedonia, but not Macedonia in, uh, you know, in uh, translation in other languages. So with the J, you know, literal transcription from Slavic. Uh, and this is where the, the Macedonian government is not agreeing. So all of these issues are creating serious opposition and the birth of new, uh, new right-wing nationalism in Macedonia, in fact. And we, this is what I'm doing right now, and this is why I'm uh, being late, because uh, uh, lately I, I'm spending a lot of time with these right-wing protesters uh, in Macedonia. Two days ago, we had a 10,000 uh, 10, strong uh, protest at very heavy uh, weather conditions, and it was financed by the diaspora, in fact. And these people are against everything I just said that the government is doing. And the uh, anti-European, anti-NATO, anti-Western sentiment in the country is highest in the last, let's say, 20 years. They're completely ready to be isolated from the world and pro possibly to turn towards Russia or, or even more, uh, more East, but they do not care. They do not want to be accepted into NATO, into EU, if we have to change the name. The uh, biggest political opposition is officially not uh, not supporting this, uh, this protest. Uh, however, on the 4th of March, that's why I'm going back uh, immediately now, there will be a new uh, very big protest, but it will be a parallel protest in, in 14 other countries by the Macedonian diaspora, and there will be a screening on the square and everything. And uh, now uh, this, uh, these occurrences are also waking up uh, dormant spirits in the diaspora as well, especially in Australia. I don't know if anyone has followed this, but now the te there are very big tensions between Macedonian and Greek diaspora communities in Australia. <laughs> big billboards, there was a fight uh, 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 like a, a month ago. Uh, now there, are, there was a billboard in, uh, in Melbourne, Turks are Greeks. And then, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, so I will finish, uh, Ferenc tells me to finish. Uh, both Macedonian and Greek governments are agreeing that there should be a referenda to decide on this. And this is, it is a very, very, very dangerous for Macedonia because it will show this division first among the communities. All of the Albanians will be for the new, and then the Macedonian community will be split, or, and then it can create a lot of new problems. I don't, I didn't want to finish. I just like to have everyone speak and then yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I wanted to give a chance to others. Yeah. So, who is next? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Uh, before going to my own country, I just want to mention something that came across while I was wasting my life on the internet. It's uh, in Chile, a public commentator, a very famous person on TV, while commenting on the recent highway of immigration uh, of Haitians and Colombians into Chile, said that this is a grave danger because it can change the race. My question is, what is Chilean race? Number one, especially when we are talking about you know colonial countries, what it means to be Chilean race. But in Chile, of course, it's also somehow very popular that rightist consider themselves to be purely white for some reason, which, of course, it is not really understandable. But uh, now when I go to my own country, uh, the other day I was talking with Ferenc, and he told me that maybe it would be an interesting thing to give some updates, right? So and when I thought about it a little bit, I was like, what is the update really in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Because we can say that in the last 20-something years, nothing really changed. Because you can leave the country for 20 years, come back, things are going to be the same. Right. So because, you know, after the war, after the Dayton, everything somehow stayed inside of this frozen conflict, right? 
So the other day I read a very interesting ar article that was called Bosnian and Herzegovinian Catenaccio. And this Catenaccio is an Italian word. It, it means the great chain. And the commentator was comparing the Bosnian and Herzegovinian politics with the typical football game of Italian famous football during the late 1990s and early 2000s, where it was everything was about defense. Peak of this football was 2003 Champions League, Milan against Juventus. It was 0-0, sometimes you would see a goal, but usually nothing would happen. And this is Bosnia and Herzegovina itself. You have everybody on the defense, everybody protecting its own war games, and basically this is very much connected to whatever uh, Professor Biacchini wrote in his book, which is an excellent book and which is very nice to read because you see somebody, of course, it, we can say it's an international perspective, but we know it's also a local perspective, of course, but it is a very good perspective and clearly defines what uh, the situation inside of the country is. And that's why I would hope that some of those people who have power to make decisions would take some lessons from this book, at least when it comes to the, to the Balkans. And we can see that inside of this uh, space. We have this implementation of some something that the uh, professor talked about and which was a concept of Amarita Sen, plural monoculturalism, right? So basically you have separated communities, you have pure identities, you have this idea of pure nations. So we are pure Croats, we, uh, we never touched with anybody else, we never, you know, came across anyone else or, and so on. You destroy this idea of uh, multiculturalism uh, in a different way, or interculturalism, better say, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, basically, this could be counterposed the suggestion of, uh, of Professor Benkini as well, which is that society actually is composed of wide range of minorities, and not just one big majority, and minorities that we kind of uh, uh, basically dis, uh, disregard. And uh, what is interesting about this is uh, that these politics are still going on. Now we have a big uh, elections coming up in 2018 and the problem is the electoral law because uh, it, it has two aspects. The first aspect is the uh, decision made by the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Sejdic Finci, basically say, saying that all of those who declare themselves as others in these countries uh, do not have any rights. And this is the case. And this is not only the case for those who are Jews or Roma, but if you declare yourself as Bosnian or as Herzegovinian, you have no rights also in this country of constitutive peoples, where only these Croats, Bosniaks, and uh, Serbs have the rights. What is very interesting is that uh, recently there was an initiative to pass on the law inside of the country, uh, which would make Serb uh, constitutive in the federation, an entity of federation which predominantly is uh, occupied or is inhabited by Bosniaks and Croats. And this law was rejected by the main Croatian party, which shows its uh, intentions of clearing the territory. But very interestingly, it was also rejected by the main Serbian party, coming from the Republic of Srpska, and led by this um, president, uh, Milorad Dodik, who is loving to play this game of Trojan horse of Balkans for Russia, of course, without being paid. Um, so when it comes to this, uh, my third point in coming to this Europe and this uh, European civilization and so on, the official platform of Croatian official politics in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and which, which they promote through these conferences they like to organize and who are basically uh, frequented by people who think in the same way, uh, they, they call themselves uh, Croats as the carriers of uh, European values in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they oppose this idea to the Bosnian Caliphate, which they uh, like to identify Bosniak politics with. It's a, it's a very dangerous idea, but if we consider the European space, they maybe try to find some appeal uh, among the European rightists. Because they like to say that uh, citizen type of Bosnian Herzegovina would uh, basically signify, and these are the words of the Croat member of the presidency, a caliphate inside of Europe, which of course uh, just tells you the, the level of discourse. So what I want to ask myself and what I'm constantly asking myself is what are these European values that uh, they are promoting at these conferences? Uh, because uh, as we can see, and especially if we are talking about the liquidity of Europe in Bauman's way as well, we don't really, we are not sure what, what are we, of course, and we can never be sure what is this Europe. And in this kind of sense, I would like to cite, and this is the, the final point I want to make, uh, the Miroslav Hroh, who, while writing about the situation in Central Europe, and it very much resonates with what we are going through, I think, in Europe at the moment, he says, and it, it is also connected 
with what Jim mentioned yesterday, that how Thatcher is saying that there is no society and we, we can connect it with this neoliberal idea and so on, he says, and I quote, nationalism or, or ethnicity is a replacement for factors of integration inside of societies that are disintegrating. When society fails, nations appear as the final guarantee. That's it. Thank you. Uh, OK. Um, well, uh, Stefano's book is really a gold mine, so I'm, I'm going to uh, I'll pick certain aspects of it that uh, uh, made me um, think um, about um, societies uh, and therefore sociology and also uh, uh, the historical developments that um, of very complex nature that um, he uh, masterfully weaves through um, uh, this book. Uh, so it is really a gold mine for historians, sociologists, in addition to uh, political scientists. Um, now, on the one hand, um, it deals with the formation of the nation in tandem with uh, the nation state. Um, this is a very interesting thing, but um, it made me think of the search for a nation state in terms of, in Western Europe, in terms of really a search for jurisdiction, in the sense that in Western Europe, the notion of jurisdiction evaporated after the fall of Rome. Uh, not in Eastern Europe, because uh, nothing happened to the Constantine's empire. In other words, um, in Western Europe, you had a loss of a jurisdiction um, uh, following the loss of a state. So it, it had to, uh, people had to claw up to uh, create uh, larger and larger entities, as I said, Yesterday, uh, where um, rule could establish, uh, rule could be established, and therefore um, uh, a an orderly, predictable way of, for example, um, providing uh, safety for the merchants could could be established. Well, that is one aspect of it that um, I think. Um, there is a very strong clue to what I have been thinking in terms of how do we move from uh, the fragmentation, uh, the medieval fragmentation to a state. And the book has very clear clues, as far as I'm concerned, to uh, follow that. And uh, the other side, on the other uh, hand, there is uh, from the sociological angle, uh, there are clues to understand better the transformation of traditional communities across Europe into modern national units. There is, therefore, a uh, transition from, as the sociologists say, from community to differentiated society. Um, actually, we are really talking about uh, different forms of affinity in approaching uh, the issue of uh, nation. Uh, forms of affinity. But if we scratch the surface, as you masterfully do, then we find out that the, the forms of affinity differ. And that is why it is so important, this liquid form, because forms of affinity, if I may say so, are culturally authentic, and therefore forms of affinity are not, uh, cannot be so easily described in Durkheimian terms because they differ locally, um, not only Eastern Western Europe, but actually forms of affinity. Do we shed our traditional forms of affinity? Well, we apparently don't. 
uh, we apparently don't, as uh, the comparison of the Ottoman Balkans to the uh, current uh, situation in the Balkans and to um, decades ago, the internecine in strife in the, in, in the Balkans. So, um, on the one hand, we have a clearer perspective on how we can um, uh, reread uh, with an idea of the limitations of modern sociology, uh, the ways in which uh, communities and, and societies uh, perpetuate their forms of affinity. They are not at the same time, all differentiated uh, and um, uh, therefore um, uh, become a um, differentiated in the sense that uh, you choose your affinity in uh, the sense that there is a personal choice in your friendship. It is not your extension of your family or tribal uh, kinship, forms of kinship. I think they may be continuing uh, together, which makes a difference. So maybe a better way, and you mentioned that too, maybe a better way to uh, classify this is not a diachronic way, but uh, classify this in terms of um, the degree of cosmopolitanism in urban centers versus uh, forms of affinity that continue in um, in uh, uh, villages, mountainside, and, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> apart from the, the, the uh, forms of affinity, um, let me come back for a second to uh, a nation as a jurisdiction, because by looking at the nation state as a modern form of rule is, in fact, a safe haven that you have a jurisdiction in which there is a citizenry. And that citizenry uh, is defined in a secular way to essentially uh, take away the divisive or centrifugal effect of uh, uh, ethnicity or uh, confessional preferences. It doesn't happen, does it? I mean, um, so it is uh, basically a uh, scientific way of classifying that does not really answer all the questions of erratic human behavior. Um, and we are faced with that. Um, I think 19th century sociology did great service to clarify certain things. But it could not define the essential uh, contradictions in uh, human uh, behavior. So, you know what, we should not be surprised there. We say forms of affinity are locally defined, uh, and I think there is, we, we, we have to admit that. Um, uh, I think um, the way in which a definable community, and I'm not so sure that I like Anderson's uh, dis description of that imagined uh, community, because it can easily be contested. Because actually, if you think that perception, I mean, if you admit that perception is reality, particularly politically, I mean, people vote on the basis of perception, so it delivers a realistic result that with which we have to uh, live. So consequently, think this notion that whether you call it the nation state or a nation and so on and so forth. On the one hand, it has a primordial aspect of it, a uh, tribe, clan, and it comes from there. 
or just impose that you are all. Uh, or, as modern nation, it is a secular, clear unit of rule that the, um, the uh, uh, society chooses its form of rule. Um, I which I really mean that you have a, a uh, society and you, that society is in clear borders so it has the type of um, uh, clearly defined uh, 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 jurisdiction that has been essentially there since Westphalia. Uh, without that, Westphalia would not have been possible. But there is another aspect of it, I think, uh, your um, uh, this deep study makes me very much aware is that when you define a jurisdiction in terms of nation, that definition essentially requires that there is an opposite. It is defined in relation to an other or several others. So therein that it that uh, modern civil civic entity that is called citizenry essentially one step away is an exclusive clan like structure and we we go between the two and we say EU is the civic side and the Balkan conflict is the is the uh, clannish side that comes, but uh, they all define themselves as um, uh, nations. And there, of course, uh, your description of the Balkans, it's also, and, and the role of the EU is very, very important, because it is not self-definition. It's also a perceived way of looking at legitimizing um, very clearly expressed there that the both the US and the EU basically look at and, and ascribe uh, legitimacy, political legitimacy, to parties on the basis of ethnicity and confessional. Um, I have to, I could go on, but I will not. But uh, one thing that Erhard uh, mentioned about the Ottomans, I would want to put uh, a word or two there. Um, that the Ottomans, uh, some, some corrective aspect of, of uh, uh, the, the empire. The, two points. One is that uh, the Ottoman history is uh, complex and it certainly is not understood by uh, the uh, current political cadres in Turkey who are, have not read Ottoman history, obviously. Uh, just to give you one example that who would name the third Bosphorus bridge uh, Selim the Grim bridge? Uh, they obviously did not know the uh, Western translation of Selim the Second Selim the Grim, and <laughs> that. the other aspect that, that ties in uh, with the, the treatment of 19th century Balkan nationalism and then later Balkan nationalism is that um, essentially the uh, heartland of the Ottoman Empire was the Balkans, and the Balkans were lost, the Ottoman Empire was lost. So it is through the Balkans that the Ottoman Empire really uh, became a cosmopolitan uh, empire. And it, from the uh, 16th century on, uh, as you mentioned yesterday, uh, the ruling elite of the Ottomans were all Balkan origin. And, the, and there, I mean, empires did things that nation states could not. 
you had the cosmopolitan ruling elite, and yet the people were uh, essentially uh, classified in ethnic and confessional terms. Um, Turk, until the later 18th century, at least middle uh, beginning of the 18th century, the word Turk uh, was a uh, denigrating word in Turkish. Let me stop there. <laughs> well, excellent comments. We could go on, and I would love to listen to you, uh, but unfortunately, Stefan was trained, uh, not now, but soon, taking him away uh, from us. So before this happened, I would like to ask him uh, to answer at least to comment some of the very, very interesting It'll only take a couple so of maybe, hours. <laughs> <laughs> only a couple of hours, yeah. So it should, should be replaced because otherwise we can't. So, no, no, I can. I can no, no, sit, sit, sit down chair. because, just, yeah. you know, I like I, no, I don't like to stand up. I like, I like to stand. Yeah. You would eat, yeah. Ah, the microphone. microphone. I move the microphone here. And I'll you, move over. And I beg your pardon, okay? Yeah. This is the cage. Yeah, this In this way. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for all your comments, uh, criticism. It's a very useful, uh, and they thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I would confess first that uh, my big problem with this book was to write the conclusions. <laughs> there are no conclusions. <laughs> and uh, you know, but in all the books, at a certain point, you have to write uh, the conclusion. <laughs> Which conclusion should I write? Because I, I appreciate also the contribution of the young generation that were already going further. What happens later? Uh, what is going up? Because this is what's the, the question that is not a, an ending story. Eh? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of fact that uh, probably even the fact that, that I decided to try to reinterpret the nation through the liquid uh, uh, Interpretation, liquid, uh, liquid notion, uh, led led to me to have uh, an idea of something that is uh, under development and will not stop a certain point unless something happens. So most of you uh, stress the f uh, fact that uh, the the book is pessimistic in uh, in some way. And uh, I appreciate your comment, Attila, when you said uh, I'm interested particularly in the future. Uh, and I'm interrogating the past in order to understand the, the, the lines of the future. Well, this is part, uh, to a large extent true, uh, <laughs> because my concern is, of course, what is our future. And, uh, and I think that we can learn a lot from the past experience if we are able to hear what the, the, the past experience says. Regretfully, as, I, as you have also mentioned, not only policymakers very often, but also the media do not hear anything about that. And they have a great responsibility in the way how they transfer the, uh, the uh, information, the notion, the categories that they use. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when, uh, uh, when you say that, uh, uh, for instance, I'm connecting about the future, uh, well, uh, and, the pessim and the pessimism. Well, I'm pessimism, a pessimist because in this moment I see a decline of something that represented something new in the history of Europe. Because we, we can like it or not, but there are no doubts that the in European integration process represented something new in the history of Europe. Something that could have a future, uh, a different future, could uh, offer a different future to the European peoples. Well, in this moment, this process is under question uh, for many reasons. 
that I have mentioned, economic reasons, political reasons, uh, ethnic reasons within the, the mechanism, different interpretation what the European integration should be uh, among the member states, uh, transnationally uh, be, uh, among the parties, uh, political parties, and so on and so forth. But I think that uh, it is still a task of, of us as intellectuals, as uh, uh, scholars, to uh, stress uh, when the, there is a decline, what is the risk? Maybe I'm uh, uh, an utopist, or a, a, this is an illusion, but I do hope that in this sense we can contribute to go in a different direction. So if we stress what is the risk, I hope that young generation, uh, policy makers, some, at least some, or some media will take a different stand in such a way that uh, it is possible. So I don't, ha I don't have a, a, the ball, let's say, where I can say, okay, they, they are assured that, every, that we are going to fragment everything and the new war will divide Europe and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, this is, but the risk exists. And it's our, our task to say, look, if you continue this way, this is, this is something that can happen. And the problem is what to do if we want to avoid this kind of risk. And this is the reason why, for instance, I always uh, deeply appreciated personally the speech of Joschka Fischer uh, at Humboldt University uh, uh, when he addressed in one of the rare policymaker statements about the needs, why we need the enlargement of the European Union. And he mentioned exactly the risk uh, of uh, having uh, a Eastern Europe abandoned to itself uh, without, uh, without possibilities of democratic development, with, under the risk of new, new and authoritarianism, as it happens in, during the 20s and even, even uh, giving as an example Yugoslavia. This is something that, uh, that has uh, some, kind of, uh, some kind of impact and explain to me why I, raised, I wanted to raise the question. Well, we have developed a democracy uh, under several uh, contexts. Democracy particularly because we involved uh, all the subjects within a, within a a state, let's say, let's say, if you don't want to use the term society, <laughs> a state, uh, a political, uh, a, um, let's say, institutional framework that participates into the selection of the elites, but with their own votes, with their own mass demonstrations, with their own uh, opinions, and so on and so forth. Public opinion, even if they are not uh, aware about the reality, because unfortunately, you are right, I perfectly agree with your point about the public opinion, the public no, but unfortunately, very often, history is made on the basis of what you know, and not of what well, is it is. Ignorance. Uh, uh, ignorance. But yeah, of, uh, imagine, in, in fact, a government. Uh, the government de uh, decides, in comparison with other governments, uh, on the basis uh, of what they assume that is true. But uh, they are not in the government uh, of, uh, of the other state to know exactly what they think. So imagine, for instance, all the, the difficult relationships within, between um, NATO, let's say, because I don't prefer to use the word EU in this moment, but NATO and Russia. Today, even in the question how to deal with Putin and so on, they, they, they assume that Putin is going to do such certain action. But what about Brexit? Yeah. Brexit is the ultimate example. Uh, exactly, exactly. The, the example for exactly. your entire argument. Yes, yes, yes. Brexit is another example. Yes. So this is something uh, on, uh, that we have to cope with. So the fact that uh, knowledge, at a certain point, is relative, because uh, because you cannot know exactly what go is going on. So the perception becomes very important, uh, and uh, and and this is something that is very very crucial. Think, for instance, uh, what happened during the Cuban crisis. Mm. 
<laughs> All the decision, what happened between Khrushchev and, and Kennedy was based about a perception. Even when Khrushchev sent his famous letters, uh, no one in the team of Kennedy could guarantee that the, really these letters were written by Khrushchev. So at a certain point, they decided it is, in this, it, it, it is Khrushchev, but they were not sure. And then they decided to have the, the phone call uh, in order to, to speak each other, because otherwise they could not, understand, could not have the evidence what is happening. And, and this, is, this is exactly one of the key points that I found in, uh, in the analysis of history and the perception of the past, because we have different perceptions of the past. And well, then, uh, when you mentioned the fact, of, uh, who are the Austrians? It's a perfect question. Yeah. But I think that this can expand it to lots of other uh, contexts. Uh, think, for instance, who are the Polish? And even today, when we are speaking about our time, I was really surprised that at a certain point, again, Kaczynski and Saakashvili unveiled a monument to the Intermarium. Sorry. This is something that was confined to, to the uh, period of Piłsudski. No. Suddenly they come back again, yes, like uh, the magicians uh, from, the, uh, from the hat, uh, the, the, uh, again the idea of intermarium. But this, is, this can have a dramatic impact on the sense of security between Europe and Russia. And Russia is our neighbor, like it or not. Because from Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Latvia uh, this, is, this is our neighbor. And it's a powerful neighbor because they have the atomic bomb. So it's, it's something that, uh, uh, that requires a certain, a certain consideration. And then when we speak about identity, yes, I agree. What are the identities? And why we are speaking about identity and not about identities? Uh, the plural. In this case, uh, the plural, this will be connected to individuals rather than to society, because we are used to have one identity for a society. Who are the Austrians? And who are the Croats? The Croats uh, with uh, their own uh, majorized uh, aristocracy, with uh, the people that uh, were under the Serenissima culture, and uh, uh, they had the double Italian and uh, Slavic name and surnames, or the, uh, the Unga in, uh, in Croatia proper, with the Hungarian, uh, Hungarian or, uh, or Croat name and surname. The same was in Vojvodina and, uh, in, uh, and in between Lithuania and, and, uh, and Poland. And, 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 and this is, uh, again, what struck me, it was also the, to, to uh, try to compare different areas of Europe and to, to discover that there are lots of similarities despite the differences. In the way how they approach, for instance, the, the differences between uh, the Serbs and the Croats, I mentioned, and the, and the Polish and the Lithuanians. And the fact that, for instance, there were uh, ideas to bring all them together and ideas that they want to separate them. And in order to separate, they need the wars. This, this tells us something. If we wanted to separate, there is a war. So how can we construct a, a, a future where we can cooperate and coexist without, uh, by avoiding a war? This is the key point. Because it is for our future. Why the future should have a game war? L look at Yugoslavia in the moment that they want. The exception there is, and in fact, I, I gave a, one a chapter, and this is the exception uh, of Czechoslovakia. But sorry, they were only two at that point. It's much easier when you have to negotiate between two, although it's more, much more in the case of EU and, and Brexit, it's not between two, it's between 27 plus one. Uh, actually, and and the same is when uh, between Yugoslavia there were six or maybe seven or maybe eight uh, subjects that <laughs> were negotiating, and uh, and with all the differences inside, and it was uh, obvious that uh, uh, the risk of war existed. And I remember, for instance, I remember when. Uh, in 
uh, I was criticized as uh, uh, as uh, as a person that uh, uh, was hysteric. I could not f forget this. Uh, as a hysteric person, when we had a meeting uh, in uh, uh, London at the Chatham House, uh, an Italian-British meeting speaking about the future of Europe after the fall of communism in Central Europe. But with, it was 1990, July, when, uh, uh, when Gorbachev was still in power, and Ante Markovic was still leading Yugoslavia. And I was hysteric because uh, in front of the description of my British colleague that Yugoslavia will fall apart and uh, in different countries and uh, peacefully, and I argue that this will not be possible because, in my view, this could have been possible only through uh, atrocities of war. And he told me no, because it will be very easier to move the population peacefully from one country to another, <laughs> so from a region to another. And I explained that uh, even uh, Gandhi failed in this, uh, in this exchange of population. So imagine in Yugoslavia the people that move with their own things uh, from one region, meeting the others, uh, moving in the opposite direction, and they say, hello, hello. <laughs> this is something that is impossible to think. Not and the I was considering... Yugoslav yes, exactly, exactly. And I was considering... Uh, so uh, this is, uh, this is uh, again, just to explain why, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, if there is uh, some pessimism in the book, it's not because I'm sure that uh, everything will go well, uh, bad, but on the contrary, because I think that it's our task as scholars to, under, to try to understand the, the risk of certain developments and to stress what should be done in, in, in this sense to go uh, out from this kind of trap. And in my view, in my view, it's at least we have to reconsider the question of identities, of our identities, in a different way, in a different way. Going out from, let's say, the constraints of the nation state, because this is a construction. We, are, we have also spoken about of the primordialist approach of the nation. Well, I think that to a large extent, even the primordialist can be constructed. <laughs> so, but the, the primordialists will never accept this. <laughs> they, will, they will reject this kind of, of, of approach. But actually, this is something that can be uh, constructed. And Tujman was a master from this point of view in terms of constructing, constructing a, a primordialist Croatian uh, sense of identity, eh? uh, which is, can be... Uh, Deeply, deeply contested yeah? uh, from several documents uh, from history. So, uh, just to say uh, some other uh, uh, Yeah, I understand. On the one hand, you said that, uh, the uh, identity, national identity, do not exist, or you, you said failed. Okay, they failed, they don't exist, but it's a matter of fact that, that politics was constructed by using these kind of terms. And, they, and, and, and we have to, to cope with this, the fact that people have been educated on the basis of, this, of these notions. So we, we have to, to think in a different way, to, uh, to reconstruct even the, the way how to teach, how to, uh, to reconstruct a narratives. This is again a, 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 a word that you have used, the narrative. Which kind of narrative do we need in order to, uh, to, 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 to accept that we have uh, even different interpretation in the past and then different... Let, let think, for instance, because we have mentioned Austria. Uh, lots of the personalities that we have in common between Italy and Austria are, for Italy, heroes, for you, traitors. Obertan, Guglielmo Obertan, for instance, just to give you an example. So how can we together treat these personalities unless we want to say, well, this was the weather, the time, the way how they were thinking, the way how they were developing their own, uh, their own approach to the reality. Now we are building something else. We, are, we can look from the distance, we can accept both the interpretation 
because both have some element of, uh, of, of truth, and at the same time we can say, well, but actually uh, we, are something, we are building something different, where we have both this kind of identity and uh, even more, and we can construct a different future through a project of European integration. So integration, and it's not by chance that all of you insisted on the fact that whether it's a citizenry, whether it's ethnicity, everything is in, in exclusive and not inclusive. How can we build an inclusive, uh, an inclusive institutional framework if you don't want to use the term society? This is, something, this is the great challenge. And the great challenge for the for the young for the young generation is this some, something we should bring you to yeah. Northern Ireland. Uh, I I, uh, I accept also your criticism about Wallace, what you said about Wallace and 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 Truman. But this is a, uh, one of the key points that shows and confirm, in a sense, that the Americans gave the first responsibility about the the beginning of the Cold War. As, as the uh, revisionist historians in America stressed in the 60s, but not in the 50s, uh, in, the, yeah. in the 60s. Yeah. So this is something that is, uh, is true. And to, to what extent, for instance, the, uh, uh, the idea of intervening in, uh, uh, in, out, in the outside world by NATO, for instance, just to give you an example, with Kosovo, uh, created a precedent uh, and uh, suspicions in other countries about, uh, about uh, this issue. It's obvious that even the incorporation of Crimea created a precedent that now is, uh, can create also suspicions in other countries. In this case, I mean, is even in Belarus and in Kazakhstan, because even if they don't say anything, they think. <laughs> and they and they take into consideration the, this uh, element, but all these elements uh, create frictions within the inter international uh, international uh, framework, and uh, and uh, they don't create trust. Mm -hmm. And exactly. and this is exactly, exactly the, the key point: how to create trust is uh, the question of identities and the plural, something that can create bridges of trust between individuals and persons. Because everybody can have an, a, 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 an identity or can claim to have an identity. <laughs> the point is, well, an identity or more identities. If they are starting to think that they have more identity, probably they can accept that they have a, a different kind of approach to the reality. When I speak to my students again, very often we speak about also the feminist contribution to the idea of nation. And to what extent, for instance, uh, the body matter from this point of view. The body matter for the simple reason that, as you know, because we have already said the same sometimes, because women, a certain point of their own life, they have the chance, if they want, to become two, and to be two in their own body. This is an experience that I cannot have. Impossible. And this is something that we have to start to think when we have, for instance, a, a, another, uh, another body within our, our body. This means that we have to cope with the fact that we are two. But the fact that we are two is a, a matter of fact that is in any partnership or in any, uh, in any uh, uh, social context. So how can we in this sense, build this, uh, this uh, uh, social relationships with the reality. And in this case, there are different identities that the, the people have and should be accepted by the others. But accepting the otherness, this means that we have to think in a different way what the democracy is today. The democracy is not enough to say that we need fair, free and fair elections, that we need uh, parliaments, uh, rotation of the, uh, of the policy makers, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is important, but it's not, not any longer important the more that we are facing with the complexity of our society. And uh, uh, this complexity is increasing, is not decreasing. The time-space the time compression that we, you have mentioned is uh, suggesting that, uh, again, this, uh, this uh, uh, society is becoming the more and more complex and transborder, transnational, 
is going liquid. Liquid. It's liquid. And so, how to cope with uh, democracy with liquidity? This is this is this is a, 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 a great question. How to to give a new content to democracy? I think this should be one of the key issue uh, for reasoning in, for the future. Thank you. Bravo, Professor.